have an extraordinary guest, uh, Australian lawyer, uh, human rights advocate, who was born in a refugee camp in Ethiopia and is now the director of the Sazelman Cowan Centre. Uh, Nyadol Nguyen, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thanks so very much for the invitation. Uh, well, firstly, congratulations on your appointment as the new director of the Sazelman Cowan Centre. Uh, are you enjoying the gig so far? You're probably getting your feet under the table. Can you tell us a bit about the centre and your vision for the role? Yeah, so the centre focuses uh, on um, uh, sort of the intersection between law and cultural diversity. And some of our programmes that we run at the moment are building up the capacity of community organisations and the leadership of community organisations to be able to effectively run their organisations um, well. So that sort of governance um, training. And um, but then we also have a, a part of the university, part of the, the, the centre that does with that deals with research. So there was a number of research projects that were being led by the former uh, director, uh, Kathy Leister. Um, and then we have our oration. So that's more the thought leadership, I think, you know, for lack of a better word. And this year, I am really hoping to be able to bring one of the judges um, who came from Afghanistan to deliver the oration for this year. Um, and um, so those are some of the stuff we're working on in terms of the direction. Um, very much at the beginning stages of thinking about the strategic direction of the center for the next three to five years. Um, and uh, I think we, we, we're still going to maintain our core themes of research, community engagement, um, awareness raising in terms of working with the legal industry about what issues communities are facing and how the legal industry or the legal sector can respond, um, as well as some, um, some uh, thought leadership um, uh, sort of projects and one of the things we're looking at is probably running a running a, a series um, on the question of data and data power and how data is going to be a big a big part of government making decisions and who gets seen in the way we collect data and, and who doesn't and what does that are sovereign to mean so it's, it's sort of having the same conversation but in a different context so that's yeah so, sounds great. Um, you, you've had a, uh, an extraordinary um, upbringing, uh, background. You've had a very traumatic childhood. You're experiencing refugee camps, uh, fleeing conflicts, uh, being separated from uh, your mother, uh, your father passing away. Uh, you arrived here as an 18 year old in 2005 uh, without a cent, new country, had to learn language and customs and the like. Yet against all the odds, you actually excelled uh, in your studies, uh, graduating um, with a JD at Melbourne Law School. Do you reckon your, your, your background, your early experiences helped you develop, um, I guess, a strong determination and uh, build uh, resilience to enable you to go on and complete your law? Um, I think yes and no. I think I think I I think because of what I maybe survive, I, I had the belief that I could survive things in the future or things that I faced or maybe um, I could look at what I was facing at the moment and think this is not as bad as what happened in the past. So I think definitely um, it influenced perspective. I had a much more uh, a deeper perspective about issues and as a result could, could hang on for longer when things seem difficult in the new country. Um, I also think it gave me a big sense of um, hunger. Like I, I, I knew that I wanted to get things done because I was quite aware, vividly aware of just the, I suppose, just the chance by which I got that opportunity to be able to go after those things because I was, you know, just a few years ago, I was in a refugee camp and now I could, you know, I could pursue further studies when two, three, maybe five years ago, it seems completely impossible. So I think that gives me a much more sense of um, urgency and hunger to do things. But I also think that with time, I've also, I can also now see the impact of what trauma does. And, and as much as you, um, and, and, and also how things like resilience and achievements are in themselves sort of coping mechanisms to deal with trauma. Um, to find meaning outside of what you, your life might have been confined to by the traumatic experience you, you've, you've had. And I'm now beginning to appreciate that that's also a very narrow way to live life, you know, and that life, you know, trying to find ways of expanding my life, that it's not just so much about constantly trying to achieve things and constantly trying to aim for things, but also um, looking at um, 
uh, trying to rebuild a sense of an inner self and a sense of a more, you know, a person that is satisfied with, with who they are and their comfort. And I think that's a lifelong process that we all have to deal with whether or not we've gone through trauma. But I think trauma shapes it in a very different way. So I would say yes and no. Mm. Sure. Um, well, you're also, um, and I don't know where you find the time, but you're also now chair of the uh, Harmony Alliance, which is a, a not-for-profit uh, working to empower uh, migrant and refugee women and give them a voice to advance their interests, both, uh, well, economically, socially, culturally and politically. Can you tell us a little bit about that role and the intersection, if any, that that has with your legal career? Yeah, well, my... Um that, that role is one of the national bodies. So Harmony Alliance is one of the national bodies, um, women national bodies, and we focus on migrant refugee women. And and um, I took on that role about two years ago after Maria Dimopoulos, um, who was the former chair, left. Um, and um, one of the reasons I, I took the role was because I, I liked the advocacy aspect of it, the fact that it... Um, um, it, it sort of listened to the voice of the community or community of migrant and refugee women and, and bring those decision, those discussions to the forefront of decision makers. And so we were part of uh, conversations around um, the new um, plan and development around um, you know, our national response to domestic violence against women and children. So it, it gives migrant and refugee women through the Vessel of Harmony Alliance an opportunity to engage in national conversations. I don't think, to be honest, I don't think there's a really a lot of connection between a, a lot of the advocacy work I've done in terms of um, anti-racism work or anti-extremism work or um, Harmony Alliance work, because I worked as a commercial practitioner uh, predominantly at Arnold Block. Um, and in a way, that was a very strategic decision. I knew that um, I was always interested in social justice. And I, and I knew that if I ended up working in that space as well, it was going to be just too much to sort of um, volunteer in it and also work in it. And I and I also wanted to explore different parts of my identity and my sense of interest. Um, and so I, I, I practice commercial litigation. Um, so there's not a lot of crossover, um, only in terms of sort of the transferable skills. I think the ability to communicate, the ability to write, those are definitely skills that I've, I've been able to utilize in my advocacy work. And they've and the majority of the training for that skill occurred in the legal, the legal sector. And so what was it, um, and do you remember at what stage in your journey, um, what was it that triggered, what stage of your, of your journey did you decide, I want to do law? Uh, I decided that when I was in the in Fatima refugee camp, um, I think I was about 13 or 14. Um, I was in the equivalent of year 10, I think, in Kenya. And I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I was always interested in in um, in, in law, or not always, but was interested in law. Um, so I I, I recall uh, giving a public speech um, and saying I'm going to be a lawyer one day, and, and people actually laughed, um, which made sense because it seems highly unlikely that a refugee kid was somehow going to be you know a lawyer one day. It just seems really far fetched. Um, uh, and yeah, but it was it was a good dream to hold on to. It gave me a sense of direction. Fantastic, and and you've been a an extraordinary advocate for refugees, migrant, uh, and indigenous rights for quite some time. Um, and some would say that Australia's treatment of these groups hasn't uh, and isn't likely to change much. Um, I, I've heard you say in the past that multiculturalism um, is all about living with each other without fear of each other. Um, do you think things will change uh, in the immediate future? And, and how do you stay positive in the face of the many setbacks that you've had? I can't guarantee that things will change in the future. And I, but I also know that that's not, that, that, that is not, for me, the reasons for why I engage in this space at all. And I don't think that should be the reasons for why anybody should engage. I think your job or all in our different capacity and our talents and our ability is to do what we can in the time that we're given in the you know in the society that we're in and whether that changes things in the future or not that is not really up to us I think our point is to try and do the work now so for me is it's 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 a matter of personal duty I think that you know it's the way I I, I would I would want the society that I live 
in to be like is the way that I would like to be treated. So that's the personal personal aspect. Um, and 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 also because I have children, so I do want a better future for them. So yeah, I don't know if things are going to change, but I think despite whether or not they will change, I'll I'll try to do my part and I'll encourage others to continue to do their part because. Um, if we don't, then they're guaranteed to not change at all. Uh, I think the other thing is um, the other thing is just because just because one of the reason I think you know it's not a very good measure of why you should do anything is whether things will change. Is because even if things change, they're not guaranteed to remain the same. I think before this interview, we we're talking about you know the leak uh, um, from the U.S. Supreme Court about the potential um, overturn of Roe and Wade. You know this uh, five years ago. People would have thought that's, you know, a completely settled law in one of the more stable democracies in the world and that this is not something that we would see significant reversal of. But here we are we're potentially um, in a highly politi politicized court now, in a highly politicized and partisan environment, uh, in a weakening democracy. We're now beginning to see how, you know, institutions are maybe flawed. Uh, faltering, even though other people might see it as a win. So maybe for conservative, it's a win. So I think that's another reason why we should do our best with the time we have is because if what we win will require an, a, another fight for the next generation of young people. Um, I have to say at the moment, I'm not very hopeful. Um, I think there's a lot of things in the world that seems rightly hopeless. You know, it's the, um, the Russia inv invasion of Ukraine, uh, for me personally, the kind of conversation and responses to the Ukrainian war that that um, made made the experience for me uh, a, a sort of a, an experience that exemplify the value we still give to human beings based on their race. So you can see the disparity between the reaction to Ukraine and the reaction to Syria, for example, and how that emphasizes a narrative that we still have race as a fundamental functioning way of how we prioritize who's need. So that was another, you know, another reason for, for a sense of hopelessness. And then you see what is happening in the United States and what that suggests about the potential of stable democracies to almost crumble between our you know before our eyes so there's a lot to be it, there's a lot to be concerned about but I think but I also think that should really just give us more uh uh sort of just to, just to, that should confirm to us the need as to why more and more people should engage in the fight for the things that they they really um, believe in whether it's the, uh, uh, the fight for climate justice or is the fight for racial justice or is the fight for indigenous rights because if we had taken it for granted in the past that somehow we've won these battles for the future, now is a time that show us that we haven't. So we need as many young people and as many conscious citizens to stand up and keep pushing because, yeah. So that, I think that's my position. I hope it answers the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot to be concerned about, which means um, a lot to fight for. Uh, yeah. So absolutely makes sense. I, I guess my last question to you is one for our students, based on your experience, based on uh, your, your your background based on your journey. If you had one or two bits of advice for our students who um, you want to do work that makes a difference, uh, what would that advice be? Um, one that I think it's useful is look after yourself. I think people who care about social justice um, care deeply about the world, and that can be a heavy psychological burden to carry around. So I think it's important to look after yourself and look after your mental health and look after your physical health, because I've had to learn that the hard way, I think. Um, it doesn't seem like an obvious one, but I think for me, the way I've, ki I've kind of learned it's the amount of overwork that I've sort of put myself through. So I think that's just a foundational thing. Um, and the, and the, 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 the second big issue is, in, you know, find something you're passionate about and keep going, <laughs> keep fighting for it, keep pushing for it, convince the people you care about to join it. Um, because it's a very strange time to be alive. I, I kind of feel just, just the amount of, the amount of things that are going wrong across the world in, and then when you think about the fact that we are even facing the issue of climate change, um, that we haven't even begun to address, you know. So there's so many things that are happening that requires more and more people to jump in. So pick a course and keep fighting because we need we need more people out there um, that cares deeply about the world and 
where it should be it should be headed and um don't don't wait for someone else to do it <laughs> because most of the time you are the person that other people are also waiting for yeah Dol, can i say it's been uh, an absolute pleasure speaking with you and students there's some great advice there yes there's lots of, lots to be concerned about but that means there's a lot to fight for be kind to yourself along the journey find something you're passionate about um but don't give up. Just keep fighting because uh, the world needs you. We all need you. Uh, can I say, Niadol, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and thanks for giving our students that great advice. Thank you so much. Thank you and good luck.